Hello and welcome to episode 170 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Los Angeles. I'm Nathan Fox. With me in Vienna, Virginia, Ben Olson. Yep. Hey, how's it going? Awesome, man. Um, There's about to be this weird stuff. I've heard there's rumors that there's going to be thing wet stuff falling from the sky here in LA. What? What? Wet? I don't know. So they call it, <laughs> um, like like slime. I don't know what it is. Like what could fall from sky, the sky? I don't understand. I don't know. But everybody's like freaking out because it's like possibly gonna. Yeah, things are gonna happen. I don't know. Yeah, we've had some of that here, by the way. Oh, you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah I could tell you about it someday. No, <laughs> well, we're about to experience it. We're we're like seriously, uh, we're we're seriously buckling down here. I had to turn on the heat in my place. Um, <laughs> in anticipation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's funny. How you doing, man? Good. So last night, um, uh, I hosted the first ever strategy prep office party. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. We just went to a restaurant that was in, um, our old building. There were 19 people who came and yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Just had drinks and food. How do you have um, nineteen people in your organization? <laughs> so the the invite was to all the people who help with proctoring, tutoring, um, the extra help sessions on Thursday. AJ, you know, who helps with the demon, Matt, and and then a friend. And so a lot of people who came brought a friend. So I would say there's probably nine people, maybe. Wow. Yeah. And friends. So that was, it was cool. It was good to talk to everybody and meet their friends and get to know them a little bit better. Um, some of the, a lot of these people, you know, they're they did very well on the test, which is why they're helping out with Thursday extra help sessions or things like that. So um, they were all talking about the schools that they had applied to and the interviews that they had experienced. And two of them talked about Georgetown's interview process, which we're going to talk about more today. And so that was super interesting. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear about it. We have, um, today on the show, we have, uh, someone who wants to go as go by, um, struggling Jewish actor, but, uh, (laughs) he sent, um, a very detailed, report from his Georgetown interview. And yeah. so we're, I, I can't wait to dig into that. Um, we're also going to do a PSA on, uh, on two spaces after a period. We, we might, we might slightly back off of that a little bit, but we're going to talk about it. We have an update yeah. from LSAC on the 2019, 2020 testing year. Can't wait to see that. Mm-hmm. Hope, hope it's another one of their awesome emails. We have a uh, question from a listener about question stem first. Oh boy. Okay. I can feel mm. a rant coming on. And if we have time, we're going to do uh, LSAT India question number four. You can email the show help at thinking LSAT.com. Send us your uh, selfies when you do that. So we can have a, a face to go with the name. We have 1,137 members in the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. You can join that group while you're there. You can give the Thinking LSAT Facebook page a like. On Twitter, I'm at in Fox. Ben is at Olson Benjamin. The show is at Thinking LSAT if Twitter is your preferred uh, social media. You can visit strategyprep.com and foxlsat.com to learn about all of our services, including live classes in D.C., L.A., San Francisco, and all sorts of online and one-on-one options. You can also visit lsatdemon.com if you'd like to see our joint project. Ben, any uh, updates on the demon? Yeah, we're gearing up for um, a big update in about a week. So I guess once this comes out, it'll be a a few days after that. What's in the big update? Well, several things. Once we know that we can deliver these things, I will announce them. Yeah. So we have a big mysterious update that's coming soon. We'll probably talk about that more next week i have we will, yep. mm-hmm. i have some demon work to do today because i have uh yesterday i got a few requests for new explanations and uh i will be recording those as soon as we get off the show today i did not do them yesterday ben because as you know yesterday was my super exciting 43rd yeah. birthday 
My goodness, why didn't I say anything? Happy birthday, Nathan. <laughs> you said happy birthday to me yesterday. So I did, I uh, did. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I spent it with uh, my 80-something-year-old grandmother. We had a super hot lunch date. We have a favorite uh, deli restaurant place that we go to out in the country. So we drive out there and have a sandwich at like 11 a.m. for lunch. Okay, cool, right before the crowd gets there. Oh, yeah, the place gets super busy, so we uh, we have to get there early. And then I went and sat with my other grandparents for a little while. Um, I did a two-hour tutoring session, and then I drove five hours from (laughs) my hometown back to Los Angeles. So that was my birthday. Cool, man. Did your grandparents have any words of wisdom? Hmm. Words of wisdom. No, it was mostly about food. They, my, my grandma who lives now in an old folks home, she mostly just talks about the other people there and the food situation. Hmm. Uh, That's, that's the bulk of her conversation. My other grandparents, um, one of them, unfortunately is now like super hard of hearing. So he's not really having any conversation at all. Yeah. Um, and he's been having some health problems. So the conversation there also tends to revolve around, um, you know, drugs and hospital beds and that type of stuff. So, huh? <laughs> they must be, <laughs> they must be really proud of you, though. I mean, what you've like, you're in the big city now. You're a you're a podcast. They superstar. Have absolutely no idea what a podcast is. I think they okay. also have absolutely no idea what the LSAT is. Yeah, yeah. Law school could not be further from their experience you know i mean they they like got married at 16 and had kids immediately and just worked their asses off their whole lives in tiny little agricultural towns i mean they Hmm. (laughs) i i'm like arriving from a different planet when i visit my hometown i'm like on a spaceship (laughs) it's it's really weird like i mean I even look totally different. Like I'm, I'm half the size of most of them when I, when I arrive. Half, half the size. You, you're pretty tall. No, I mean width. Okay. And I'm not okay. even like fit or anything, but like just people who live these like suburban lifestyles, you know, they just, um, they're big. They're, 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 I don't know. My dad used to refer to it as fat and happy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if if you really are happy, then I guess that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, it's just it's just a very different it's just a very different place. I was talking to a friend about the drive from L.A. to my hometown of Ripon. You pass billboards along the way, and they are frightening. I mean, it's like pray for rain. Mm. Mm-hmm. Build dams, not trains. B- build dams not trains yes. i don't follow mm-hmm. that yeah one. because if you're going to build the train from la to san francisco you can't also build dams apparently that's what that this oh, st- stupid sure. false narrative obviously but they they hate the train for whatever reason they think the train is a big waste of money so um they they want instead they want dams because we're in a wa- you know um there's billboards <laughs> that say is growing food a waste of water question <laughs> mark the, and it's like the answer is yes when you're Obviously, when you're growing yeah. almonds in the central valley of california which is a desert yes it is a waste of water but anyway um yeah. because it's purely about money it's not about like food growing almonds and exporting them to japan is not about <laughs> it's not about feeding americans you know yeah, um, yeah. it's about rich landowners uh, they need to rephrase that question right yeah is growing almonds for japanese yeah right totally <laughs> Let's see what other billboards are there. Oh, um, there's a picture of an infant, and it says, "I had fingerprints um, six months before I was born." And then it's a, a right to life billboard. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. All sorts of very frightening things. People who aren't from California don't really understand the um, multiple different uh, places that are in California. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure they look at California as a very blue state, which it is generally, but there are lots of different pockets everywhere. And a, and a very coastal state, right? Everybody thinks that it's mm-hmm. like all ocean. When you look at it on a map, it's like, oh shit, California is the beach. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, except for the um, 
200 miles of <laughs> inland that you have yeah. and the gigantic central valley of california which is like trump supporters mm -hmm. so anyhow yeah well it is strange um because i grew up there as you know and to get out of the state you had to drive for hours at least i was in the bay area and <laughs> living over here now it doesn't take very long to get to not only the next state, but the next state after that. And so it's very common to just hop around states around here. I'd love to know the percentage of Californians who never leave California because it is not zero. I mean, like, I mean, for like their entire lives, <laughs> there, there are people. It's not zero. I would agree with you on that one. No, I mean, I, I would, boy, if I had to take a guess. Mm. Number number of people born in California, percentage of people born in California who never set foot outside of the state of California once in their entire life. Hmm. Over under percent. Uh, I have a number yeah, in mind. It. Yeah, what's your number? I, I would say like ten, but I I have a feeling it possibly could be higher. Okay, I'll. That's tough. Their whole life? Yeah, because there's lots yeah, of poor know, people who never, over. ever leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over. Because I oh, think about all the people who... Anyways. I was <laughs> young. You're talking about infant mortality? You're talking about like I don't want to school talk buses about. of kindergartners driving into <laughs> volcanoes? I wrote about that in one of my books. I still get laughs for that every once in a while. Some people are horrified by it. That's a, that's a good um, litmus test of whether you're going to like Nathan Fox in the classroom. Do you think it's funny to joke about a school bus full of kindergartners driving into a volcano? Do you think that that is amusing or do you think that that is just, oh, God, you can never say that? That's a good test. Yeah. If you think, oh, God, you can never say that, then just you don't want to take any of my classes ever. <laughs> but if you think, oh, that's funny. I mean, also, by the way, that's completely not realistic. So just fucking relax, people. That's right. Well, the, the volcano part is what makes it funny. <laughs> right. Yeah, I didn't say, oh, okay, I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> Head on into another vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, I guess we're laughing now. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Where are we? Boy, um, that got far off of the rails. Okay, so big demon update coming. Uh, what Maybe what is the LSAT demon, Ben, and how do people sign up for it? Sure. The LSAT Demon is a tool that allows you to do practice problems instantly. As soon as you sign in, you can start doing logical reasoning questions, games, reading comp passages. They are official questions, by the way. Someone just asked us the other day. They asked if they were AI generated. I just thought that was an interesting question. Nope. We do not have an AI generating LSAT questions. They are official LSAT questions. What the AI is doing is trying to figure out which ones you should be practicing on based on, on how well you do. So as you do questions, the demon tracks all sorts of things, like what type of question it is, whether you got it right or wrong, how long it took you, and so forth. Um, we don't tell you all that information. We just then decide what question to give you next. And over time, it starts to give you easier, easier questions or harder questions depending on how well you're doing. So you are always practicing where you should be practicing at. So the AI-generated questions, that's in the next update, right? That's common. You've been working on that? Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the, the uh, big secret. That's yeah. the bioterrorism <laughs> filter that you're going to yeah. install? <laughs> oh, that would be fun to read. Try to guess which one of these questions was AI-generated. Super easy. We would fail the Turing test in a second. Yeah, so that's the demon. Awesome. Let's, uh, you can sign up at uh, lsatdemon.com. Perfect, perfect. All right, so we were yelling, and we've yelled a lot lately about how we think that one space in between sentences, one space after a period, is the new modern standard. And yep. I got to say that it does catch my eye if you use two. It just doesn't look right to me anymore. I think the I, if you want to make me happy, you're going to need to go with one space after a period. And Ben, I know yep. you're the same way. Mm -hmm. A lawyer friend of mine who listens to the show texted me and said, UCLA Law Review uses two spaces between sentences. And then she said, and all the partners I work for do too. Okay. And I said, do you fix it for them? And she said, nope. We were told in law school and at the firm that you just match the partner's preferences. Many courts also use two spaces in their opinions. And then she unnecessarily, but I appreciated it anyway, sent me actually a court opinion so that I could see that there were two spaces after the periods. 
So this is an interesting argument. It uh, lends credence to the two space side, but you know, I I still take a lot of issues with it. Okay, let's hear it. You well, you so, used to be a professional writing consultant, right? I did. A legal writing consultant. That's right. So went to law school, decided this wasn't for me. Started working for a law professor at GW who does legal writing consulting, and. So we worked with a lot of different firms, a lot of partners, a lot of judges. And one thing that you learn pretty quickly is that just like you have all these different tiers of law schools, you have all different tiers of law firms and judges. And while you can find judges and partners who do a lot of things that most partners and most judges don't do, that doesn't mean that they're right, right? I mean, partly because <laughs> they're not necessarily with the majority. And so when I was working as a legal writing consultant, we even did surveys. We surveyed partners all across the country at the best firms, at as many firms as we could to try to figure out which writing um, tendencies were just idiosyncratic Right, Because a lot of lawyers complain that when they write a memo or a brief or some other document for the partner or a senior associate that they're working for, when they get edits on that document, they're not happy because they're saying, oh, well, this is just some random preference of my partner and I don't agree with it. Now, your lawyer friend is exactly right. <laughs> you need to match your partner's preferences because they're your fucking boss. Yeah. But lawyers are lawyers and so – they want to know, <laughs> am I making these changes uh, to just appease my boss? Or are these actually legit writing techniques that I should adopt? And when we did these surveys, it became very clear on several fronts what partners – and by the way, partners at more prestigious firms and judges in more prestigious courts preferred. And so when your friend says that the UCLA Law Review, which is ranked fairly high, uh, uses two spaces. I think that's great. But I would like to know about a lot more reviews. And my guess is that UCLA Law Review is ranked highly not because it uses two spaces <laughs> after its periods, but because of the content that it produces. Yeah, so I, of course. I feel like someone there decided that and maybe they're – part of the minority when it comes to two spaces after a period. The lawyer also talks about the partners. I'd be very curious what firm your friend works at that right away can indicate the caliber. And I'd also be very curious how many partners at the firm actually do that. Is it just the partners that she works with or the majority of partners at that firm? I, I really doubt it. Yeah. It's a, it's a big, it's a big firm. It's a big firm in Los Angeles. Um, okay. So yeah, that's not reputability is not the issue. Um, they definitely can still be dinosaurs though. Right. Like, I mean, they can still be wrong even though they're doing it. Yeah. And it, I'm sure that the, the way that this shit works is just, that's the way we do it. Cause that's the way we've always done it. And, yeah. uh, but you know, eventually that probably will change. I wanted to. I wanted to back off of uh, my, personally my hard stance on it. I'm always going to use one space. I just wanted to back off of the idea that no printed document or no, you know, no professional document. There, there's different standards. And um, as an atheist, I am driven by evidence. I am not driven by faith. I am driven by evidence. And so, uh, yes, you are right. I was wrong. There are sometimes places where you're going to have to use two spaces because that's what your boss wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On your law school personal statement, though, you should use one because otherwise me and Ben are going to yell at you. <laughs> okay. So after my long discussion, I did look up a recent Supreme Court opinion written by Justice Roberts, who's an excellent writer, by the way. Starts sentences with and and yet all the time. He's using two spaces. There you go. And that's your favorite justice that you were going to name your law school after. Yeah. So I won't follow him in this regard, but for those people who want to join the dinosaurs of the past, <laughs> this dinosaur is still doing it. So I will shut up. But yeah, I still, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have strong opinions 
uh, but they are loosely held here on the Thinking LSAT podcast. We have mm -hmm. we have the idea we have ideas about how we think things should be done, and we will argue for them um, strongly. But if you show us uh, better evidence, we are totally willing to acknowledge that uh, that there might be other opinions. That's why you know that's what it's like to be living in the um, evidence based world. Yeah, reality based world. Yeah. Okay. Enough of that. Let's move on to this update from the LSAC. Yeah. All right, you want me to read this? Yep. Good afternoon. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> They're just so they can't they can't not be hilarious. They're, everything they do is hilarious. I guess I'm just surprised because they're assuming that we're going to read their email as soon as we get it. Like I, I'm a little confused by this, but here is some important news regarding the 2019-2020 testing year, including the expanded schedule of LSAT administration. Notice the conclusion right there at the beginning. Here is some important news regarding. Yeah. Like the effect that that has on the reader is I just immediately am rolling my eyes like, okay, how important can this possibly actually be? You're telling me it's important. Yeah, seriously. Well, and just jump to the point. By the way, I'm... I'm very glad that we were talking about this because I was talking to some of my tutors last night about the July LSAT and, you know, the bonus that they're giving everyone. And everyone there was just like, yep, I don't see why you wouldn't take the July LSAT. I predict it's going to be a huge yeah, sellout. I, I, though, we were excited about it when we announced it on the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. breaking news when we announced it a month ago. But I have... I want to warn students. I've heard people saying that they're going to wait and take it in July because of that reason. Mm. That seems like a real dumb plan to me because if you do that, the free retake isn't going to be until September. And if you're really on your shit, you're going to be applying on September 1st, right? Like the yeah, very beginning. Which we are going to talk about in a little bit, right? With regards to the Georgetown, the Georgetown interview yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Applying early is better. And so if you're going to just like intentionally wait for, for, you know, the free retake and the cancel your score after you see it, those are nice, but law schools only care about your highest score anyway. And like retaking it for free after the admission cycle has already opened. Isn't that awesome? I, I agree that July is going to be huge. And I agree that July makes a lot of sense for a lot of people, but I wouldn't wait and make that your first attempt. I don't, I don't think that makes any sense. In fact, I think the argument should be that you should take it so that when you take, take it before July, so that when you do take it in July and you're given the opportunity to cancel your score after you see it. Yeah. Then you can keep a higher score and cancel a lower score. It becomes very easy. Do I keep this or right. not? You just know based on your previous score on record. Yeah. If that's your first test, then your then score, you should keep it. Yeah. Then you should probably <laughs> keep it no matter what, because otherwise you just yeah. can't go to law school without a score yeah. at all. So, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> we're telling people, shit. I mean, when you hear this, you it's probably not too well. What's the registration deadline for? It's January. Early. The registration start date for June and July is exactly one week from today. So that will be two days after this podcast comes out. So oh, December wow. 12th. Oh, okay. So December 12th, 2018. Yeah. Both of those tests will open up and I don't see why people shouldn't sign up for both if they're, unless they're already prepping now, in which case they should sign up for March and maybe even January. What is the deadline? Let's see. January registration deadline is December 17th. So that's a week after this podcast comes out. Yeah, I mean, if you've been prepping for a while, there's you should be you should be not waiting till July. Let's put it that way. I think yeah, January makes sense for a lot of listeners. I think March makes sense for almost everyone, and then June for sure at the latest. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. if you want to start law school in 2020, you need to be taking the test earlier than you think. Yeah, and then July is a bonus. You, you can only win because either your score goes up and you keep it or it goes down and you cancel yeah. it and then you're, wow. And <laughs> yeah, anyway. Okay, so this important news. The schedule includes information about which tests will be disclosed in the coming testing year. Thank you. Why don't you just show us the schedule? 
Also, to provide Saturday Sabbath observers an option for testing in a month that has only a Saturday test date, we have revised our policy for next year to allow Saturday Sabbath observers to request to take the test on an alternative date that will be scheduled within one week of the published test date. Okay, they will first need to register for the LSAT and indicate their request for an alternative date, then provide a signed letter from their cleric to authenticate their request. Okay. Um, religious exceptions are always interesting to me because I feel like anyone in America can make we can believe whatever we want. Sorry, this is just like a side rant from law school days, but like we can believe whatever we want. So someone can just say, well, I observe the Saturday Sabbath, but here the LSAC is requiring a letter from their cleric. I understand the idea is to <laughs> avoid like people just taking advantage of this loophole, but at the same time, that's suggesting that you have to have a certain religious persuasion to get that authentication. Yeah, let's Anyways. be honest. That's an option for people who have a connection to Saturday Sabbath observation, right? I mean, how many yeah. people are there who are, you know, they could claim to be Saturday Sabbath observers if they, if it suits them. Yeah. And so this is now an option for Saturday Sabbath observers who, you know, ha Oh yeah, I can get, I can get that letter so I can, it's whatever. Everybody else can take advantage of it too. Just have a, just oh, fuck it. <laughs> you know, cleric is one of the classes in Dungeons and Dragons, right? I want somebody mm -hmm. to, I want somebody to have the cleric in their uh, D and D party, write them a letter saying that, Oh yeah, we have, we, <laughs> I'm, I'm their cleric. <laughs> They're not allowed to do stuff on Saturday. I'm going to cast the spell of, um, here's a free freebie to take the test on a different day. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's bullshit personally but whatever i don't care the whole thing's bullshit this whole the whole game is just like really really stupid right i mean <laughs> get into the whole accommodations thing it's just like yeah it, it's it's all these things creep into yeah. existence over time yeah well i mean that's like this is largely why i hated law school so much it's just it, there's it's not really about like justice it's it's or or about truth or you know right and wrong it's not science mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just like yeah, ex loopholes to the loopholes to the loopholes, right? And, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. So who cares? Whatever. There's. So what are they going to have to do? They got to get a letter from their cleric. I mean, they could have put rabbi. Cleric is a weird choice of a word. I, I don't know enough about. I don't know either. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm surprised they <laughs> use the word cleric, though. That's just that seems so. Uh, anyway. Okay, so you have to get a letter. You have to register for the LSAT. Oh, so you actually have to register for the test for the Saturday test date. Yep. And then indicate their request for an alternative date. Does that mean you can request like any date? Oh no, you just request a Within date. A week. And that that will be notice the passive voice. Request yeah. to take the date on an alternative date that will be scheduled by whom we do not know within one week of the published test date. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just take ownership of the fact that LSAC, <laughs> you will be scheduling that date. Yeah, this is so don't shy away from it. Well, the way they wrote this, it's so unclear. You don't even know if you're supposed to be requesting a specific date Yeah. or not. But, anyway, okay. Let's go on. This is this is the thing about the whole digital LSAT, right? You're you're going through all the effort to create a digital LSAT, and we're still basically just doing a paper based test on a tablet, <laughs> and all these problems would be solved <laughs> if they were using the Sylvan Learning Center thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it would take less time because it would be adaptive testing, right? You could take it any day you want, regardless of your religious persuasion. Um, you could take it. Throughout the year at any time. I mean, th this whole thing is ridiculous. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Registration for the Monday, June 3rd, 2019 and the Monday, July 15th, 2019 LSAT administrations will open on December 12th, 2018. Okay. Yep. Remember, the July 15 administration will be the beginning of our transition to the digital LSAT. And test takers will be assigned to either the paper and pencil version of the test or the digital version, depending on our arrangements with individual test centers. The September 2019 test will be fully digital. 
please review our comprehensive list of frequently asked questions about the Digital Edge LSAT for more details. Yeah, so I think the most important thing here is to take the test before July and then take it on July as a last hurrah. Yep, and some new weird policy about Saturday Sabbath something. I, oh, because they used to have a date. That's what it was. There used to be an alternate date pub that they would just publish on the site saying, hey, here's the alternate sad saturday sabbath date so wasn't what, it usually sunday or something what they're really saying is they're not doing that anymore and if mm. you want an alternate date you just have to sign up for the normal date and then request an alternate date that's the difference Hmm. maybe the person does request a specific date it's very unclear well that's the way they write at the lsac that is the way they write moving on yeah what's this one it's a question stem first question. Um, mm. Hi, Nathan. My name is Kane. I'm an undergrad at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. I've purchased your LSAT primer, Logic Games Playbook, and Logical Reasoning Encyclopedia. Additionally, I've started listening to your podcast and plan on working my way through all of them. So far, I've read the primer twice, started working through the first sections in the playbook and encyclopedia, and have made it to episode 10 on the podcast. If you've got the time, I had some initial questions and feedback for you and Ben. I'll try and be brief. One, I have always felt that reading the question and or question stems first was a bad idea. Perhaps because your stance on the issue seems to surface often, I began my studies with a heightened awareness of its implications within specific problems. Understanding the argument slash passage first is absolutely the way to go with maybe one exception. Okay. So here comes the question in regard to flaw questions. I have found that when the argument is formatted as a dialogue between one or more parties, it is helpful to skim the question stem before reading the argument. As an example, question four, section three on the June 2004 test, which is page 27 of my encyclopedia, presents an argument between Sydney and Stephanie. By reading the question stem first, I would immediately know that it is Stephanie's argument which contains the flaw I should be looking for. What are your thoughts on this? Mm, go ahead, Ben. Sure. So I'm guessing that Sydney talks first and that Stephanie responds, but I'm not sure about that. But what I often found and find in these questions is that if I read Sydney's argument, who's talking first, and as we always suggest, we read the the argument, we think about <laughs> whether it's good or bad, and it's almost always bad. I'll find myself saying, "Well, wait, Sydney, like." What about X? And then Stephanie will often say something along those lines or something slightly different. And because I have a particular opinion about Sydney's argument, when I'm reading Stephanie's argument, um, it's much easier to either agree with Stephanie and be like, yeah, I do think Sydney's wrong about that. Or, um, Stephanie, why are you talking about Y when Sydney's problem is clearly X? And bam. That's the flaw in Stephanie's argument. And so then I'm ready for the answer choices. Whereas if we do this, then it's like we're not really paying attention to Sydney, which means you're reading Stephanie's argument in a vacuum. And of course, it's contextually based because it's in response to Sydney or vice versa. So yeah, I think this is terrible advice. I think it is too. I think. Um... Anyway, how much time could it possibly save you? It's just, it feels like gimmicky trying to cut corners. I appreciate the, this is a very thoughtful question, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the answer is no. I, I, exactly what Ben said. You, you might not really be able to spot Stephanie's flaw if you didn't pay enough attention to what Sydney was saying in the first place. The way mm -hmm. these normally go is the first speaker says something. The second speaker comes back with like, a non sequitur or a misunderstanding of the first speaker's statement. Mm -hmm. I can imagine them, the first speaker, like smacking the second speaker across the face, you know, like wake up, 
idiot. What yeah. that's, <laughs> you did not listen to my argument. Either the, the second speaker might not even address the first speaker's argument. The second speaker yeah. might misinterpret the first speaker's argument. Um, lots of different ways that the second speaker can fuck it up. But yeah, if you didn't read the first speaker's statement closely enough, if you're doing this properly, <laughs> you don't need to be told which speaker makes the flaw. Yeah. <laughs> they're so they're so obvious, Ben. They're so easy. I feel like especially those two speaker ones are just if you're tuned in at all, they're just so easy. Mm-hmm. You just you read that second whoever it was that made it that did something st- either the first person says something stupid and the second speaker points it out. Or the yeah. <clears throat> first speaker says something and then the second speaker says just a ridiculous response. That's mm. how those normally go down. And I don't know if you're paying attention it's just going to jump off the page at you anyway. Yeah. You'll already know it's a flaw question and you'll know where the flaw is on your own terms, which means you won't be kicked around by the LSAT. You'll be kicking the LSAT around. Exactly. It's playing offense instead of defense and that's how you go fast. And it's also how you just never miss any questions. It's also more fun. You just, all of a sudden the LSAT is a fun little game that you get to just totally destroy. This is unrelated, but it made me think of it. Did you hear that on the most recent test on one of the experimentals, there was a question that had a double? I heard oh. that from two different people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the what we're talking about is ending in test 39. Uh, they used to have questions where you'd have a single passage and then two questions in logical reasoning for that one passage or argument. And apparently that's at least shown up again in a recent experimental section. It wasn't on the official test, supposedly. So but should I anyway. shit my pants and get super afraid if I see that? Well, just sign up for the test now and take it before it you know, happens. <laughs> yeah, because that would be terrifying if that ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they should do that more. They would save space on the page. I mean, it's really easy. I, we could do that. No problem. Right. We write one argument yeah. and then ask like four different questions. Sure. All sorts of questions. What's the conclusion? You could do a strategy question, like role question. You could do a must mm-hmm. be true. You could also then do, yeah, I mean, you could do a flaw, flaw, weekend, strength. <laughs> Ooh, you could do a sufficient assumption question and a necessary assumption question. I feel like I haven't done the old questions in a while, but I feel like there is one that actually does that. They give you one logical reasoning passage or argument and then they give you a question that's like necessary assumption that question that's sufficient assumption that's kind of cool let's write one argument this will be a joint project for us Mm. or well we could assign some of our helpers to do it okay write one argument and then write all of the different question types Ooh, yeah there you go yeah you totally do that yeah easily Maybe I'll start. Yeah, the the one that might be a little tricky is the paradox. You'd need to argue. Oh, have, that's the true. The argument yeah. would have, have to have a little bit of a irony in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. It'll have a school bus yeah. full of children driving into a volcano. That's going to be oh, part of the okay. argument for sure. Good. That'll turn off some of our listeners. Oh, good. Thank. I mean, good. We're we're constantly <laughs> trying to. Uh, you know, whittle down Pare to down. the true. Yeah, <laughs> come on. We don't. We we're, we're not for everybody. I don't want to be for everybody. I I want to be losing listeners on the regular, um, so that we just make sure that we have only the the cream of the crop still here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Question number two from Kane. This one may seem silly. I'm a pretty relaxed guy and typically do decent on tests. However, the one thing that can cause me anxiety during a test is having a small working space. Yes, this is fucking ridiculous. How much desk space is typical during an LSAT? Are there any standards or will which, or will each center be different? My worst nightmare would be taking it on one of those fold out mini desks that are attached to auditorium seats. Hey Ben. Uh, Kane. Yeah. <laughs> you know who took the test on one of those fold out mini desks that are attached to auditorium seats uh yeah the vast majority of recent test takers 
<laughs> oh, I didn't know that, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, okay. I, I thought these, I mean, I haven't heard of, I hear students all the time complaining about that, like the, the horror of if that happened to them. Um, is that a common thing on the East Coast? At least on the East Coast, that's the norm. And uh, I took the test over on your coast, and that was a true for me as well. So I, my, in fact, so people ask about this all the time in class, and I frequently tell them, look, if you're concerned about that, American University, at least in the D.C. area, is the only place that I know that consistently has large tables. Everywhere else that I hear has small fold-out desks because they're at a university and they're put you, putting you in an auditorium. I mean, D.C. is also a place where so many people take it that they have to cram in a bunch of test takers. But they're putting you in an uh, auditorium with fold-out desks that are smaller than 8.5 by 11. That's, that's the norm out here, at least. Yeah, and that's how I took the test, and it matters 0%. Well, it matters 100% if you make it into a big fucking deal. But... If you just get over this totally irrelevant phobia and just – it's about the content of the questions. This, you're not like – this is not um, – you're not drafting a uh, like blueprint for a skyscraper here. We, mm-hmm. we don't need to spread out for like a grand workspace here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the one – the little fold-out desky thing is totally fine because you just need to be reading the words – and playing the game and it's easy. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, each, each center is different. If you want to waste a bunch of calories on it, you can definitely, um, yeah, go to the, go to the Facebook group and start asking around like which testing centers have more workspace. But I, I just, this is, you're totally putting that on yourself. There's just no reason to get worried about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Number three, there are a few apps out there with a built-in, Quote, test proctor. Seven Sage LSAT is one I've played around with. The main purpose of these apps, of course, is to provide a convenient timer. However, many also include features that attempt to replicate the soundscape of the test-taking environment. The Seven Sage app, for example, has settings to adjust both background and distraction noises that play alongside the timer. Is there any benefit to using these features, or am I annoying myself to death for no good reason? Would I be better off heading to the library as suggested in the podcast? I do like people coming to take tests with other people so they get that experience. And um, some people find themselves getting distracted by their neighbors. So I think it's good to hear stuff. I'm not so confident that the app does a good job of replicating that, though. I can't imagine it does. I think it's just going to be annoying noise. Yeah, I think if you go to any public place, any library, any school, any Starbucks, you know, I I think you should be able to give yourself some distractions with, I don't know, I think it's dumb. Yeah. I do wish we had made one that had whale noises in it, though, because I think that would be awesome. (laughs) Adam, help. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Number four, if you had to answer with a straight yes or no, is it worth concerning myself at all with the essay portion of the exam? Ooh. A straight yes or no. We can't talk more. It says feel, if you had to answer with a straight yes or no. <laughs> I feel unduly constrained with this question and refuse to answer. Oh, wow. But if you had to. Oh. Gun to well, your under head. under those circumstances, I would say no. I agree. I would also say no. That's a pretty easy one. We're all getting <laughs> up. I'm getting up in arms for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> just go with it man that was the question <laughs> just go right with it all right My, yeah that's all for now it's really cool how accessible both you and ben seem to be for now i'm sticking with self-study but i'll likely enroll in your online course as soon as my financial circumstances allow for it thanks kane and again that's from boone north carolina awesome boone cool boone thank you kane yeah Weekly pearls versus turds. So far, the scoreboard is zero to three. Zero pearls, three turds. For today, let's see what we got. Ooh, this is, I'm jumping ahead and it says it's from an LSAT tutor. <laughs> Wait, an LSAT tutor? No. Heard this from? Yeah, two heard it of from students. students. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. For LR, 
This is the piece of, quote, wisdom. We'll see if it actually is. Um, For LR, do questions 1 through 18, then go to the end of the section and work backwards. 26, 25, 24, (laughs) etc. All right. What do you say, Nathan? Absolutely fucking not. Absolutely not. I think that's a total turd. For every the the reason why this turd is out there is that you can show a section where the last question in the section twenty five or twenty six, yes, you can show me an easy twenty five or twenty six. Mm-hmm. But yeah. for every one of those, I can show you an easy number nineteen. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but for every easy twenty five or twenty six you show me, I can show you a really fucking hard number twenty five or twenty six. Yeah. So I think at best, this is a zero. Like I think at best, it's just all those questions are the same approximate difficulty Mm -hmm. and you're not really giving yourself any benefit. I think at worst you can, boy, if I had to bet on, you know, what do you think is harder, Ben, on an average test, 19 through 21 or 23 through 25? Hmm. It's a good question. I, I think it's going to be about the same. I, I, I really don't think there's going to be any difference yeah. between those questions at that point in the test. I, I would say it's a tie or if I had, if I had to straight, yes or no <laughs> <laughs> straight, straight up or down, just like which one's going to be harder. I would, yeah. I would bet on 23 through 25 as being harder. So this is something that I can actually figure out. Uh, I have the data for at least 80 of the tests. So maybe sometime in, in 2019, I'll take a look at that. Yeah, you got you got bigger fish to fry, Ben. <laughs> I, I don't want you working on that bullshit. Work on, work on the demon for us. Come on. Let's, uh, what was the thing that we were going to introduce? I can't remember now. That we were going to introduce. Oh, oh, the AI generating yeah, yeah. questions. Let's work yeah, on the work AI on generation of, of new LSAT questions. <laughs> All right. Um, I would add to this. Yes. Do you, you do you get this turd every now and then where people like, you know, people are starting the LSAT process, the journey, they're coming into class, and at some point in the class, it doesn't take very long. Uh, I talk about how the earlier questions are a little bit easier, so in general, you just want to start there and not skip around. And then someone says, "Wait a sec, oh, they're easier at the beginning and they're harder at the end." So should I start at the end when I have the most energy and focus, <laughs> Nathan. What would you kindly say if you had a straight <laughs> yes or no answer? Uh, no. No, you should not. No. Nope. Why not? Your energy and focus <laughs> is heightened at that moment in time. Why not start y- there? Yeah. Well, that's like my. Uh, Next door to my parents' house, there's a gigantic orange tree. Mm. And one of my favorite wintertime uh, activities is you can go out and just pick these giant oranges off of the tree. And it's like, the, the it's unbelievable how productive an orange tree is. <laughs> like, there's, there's like a thousand fucking oranges on the tree. Mm. The strategy of doing the test in the section in reverse order like mm-hmm. starting at the end because you're fresh. Yeah. That's like you get up in the morning and you're going to go get the oranges off of that tree. And you start with like, you get the 40 foot extension ladder out and you prop it up in the branches or you lean it up on the side of the house next, next to the tree, yeah. climb all the way to the top, lean out over the top of the tree and start trying to get the <laughs> oranges at the very, very top of the tree. That's yeah. what you're doing if you start at the end of the section. Yeah, and to continue your analogy, if your goal is to get as many oranges as possible and you decide to go for the hardest ones rather than the low-hanging fruit, as they say, and you have a time limit, <laughs> how many oranges are you going to get compared to your neighbor who's like, fuck that, here's an orange, here's an orange, here's an orange, like... Start with the easy stuff and pick up as many low-hanging fruits as you can. I was almost going to say, like, if you have accommodated, you know, slash 
virtually unlimited time. Mm. I considered it briefly that in that in that situation, maybe, mm. mm-hmm. but then it's still, why wouldn't you just build confidence by doing all the easy ones? Why wouldn't it burns a lot more energy to do the harder ones? Like it does. You're, if you're, you're claiming that you're fresh at the beginning of the section, which by the way, that seems a little bit like hysterical to me. Mm. Really? You're, it's so taxing. <laughs> If it, if that's the way it is for you, that it's so taxing to do the LSAT, then it's going to be real fucking hard to do the hardest questions mm-hmm. and you're going to burn out. You're going to run out of energy faster. So yeah, no lower hanging fruit first, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, boy, pearls need to step up their game cause they're losing now zero to four. Yeah. If you've got a pearl that you've heard recently or that you've come up with, send it to us. Because we'll tell you whether it truly is. Yeah, that's help at thinkinglsat.com. Uh, next one? Yep. Hi, guys. Thank you for all your thoughtful responses to my last-minute life choice questions back in August. I waved off on a top 25 school, and I ended up getting into a T14 school at the buzzer, but still waved off for a year. I now act full-time. It's easy to get picked up for film school projects, but getting an agent is a whole other question. I thought of y'all today because Dean Comblatt from Georgetown interviewed myself and 11 other candidates in, and then we've anonymized some of this. It was actually rather fun, and I think I got the most candid view of admissions I'd heard from an admissions officer yet. He did start out with the standard whole application and not just your LSAT score routine, but it became fairly evident early on through the context that he clearly meant once the LSAT score is high enough, then we start looking at the whole applicant. That's, that echoes what we have always thought, right, Ben? Yeah. And it's pretty obvious when you look at 509 reports and you see the very narrow ranges of LSAT scores that each school admits it's pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty clear that they are making a primary determination based on your LSAT score and then looking at other factors. Yep. He split us up into groups of four and gave us admission vignettes that he said actually occurred during the last cycle. The groups were to discuss the vignettes and decide whether we'd admit or deny the applicant and give an overall impact estimate on the applicant's chances given the little information we had. We learned later that the dean's intent was to see us interact in small groups to determine our ability to collaborate. The room appeared to be full of admits, with more to lose by poor performance and little to gain with good performance. Well, wait a second. If you've already been admitted. I think he might have meant... Applicants? Yeah, like or or admits. Like, um probably getting in based on their numbers. Yeah. Like maybe Georgetown has mentally admitted them, but waiting for the final test. And this is it. I see. Vignette. I mean, and that really makes sense, right? Because why would they, they're not bringing you in for an interview if they don't want to admit you. Yeah. They're not going to waste the Dean's time with 12 people. Dude, Dean Kornblatt. Are you kidding me? Dean Kornblatt has a very busy schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So, right. And this, we know this from anecdotally. Dean of admissions, by the way. Sorry. Oh. Anyways, yeah. Um, we know this anecdotally from like Harvard interviews that most people who get the Harvard interview get in. Mm-hmm. Because, and it just totally makes sense. Like, well, yeah, why the hell would they? <laughs> this isn't a job interview situation where they're going to interview 10 different candidates and only pick one person. Mm-hmm. They're, they're trying to fill Harvard Law School, which has what, 400, 500 seats every year? Yeah. I mean, if they're interviewing you, yeah, they've, they've decided that based on your numbers and your personal statement and stuff, they want you. And then now they're just going to do the last minute, like psychopath check. Psychopath check makes, yeah, which is, so this is exactly right. You have more to lose by failing than by doing well. You just have to not fuck up. Yeah. Um, okay. He's, uh, sorry to read that vignette a, so this is awesome. We're going to go through all these vignettes. Mm Mm-hmm. Vignette A, female app. Why is that relevant? 
Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just an aside. Female applicant scored in the 99th percentile on the LSAT, ranked in the top 20% of her Ivy League school, and won multiple essay contests throughout undergrad. However, she was suspended for one year as a freshman because, according to her, she failed to properly cite sources on an essay and accompanying presentation she conducted in French. She cited recovery from a recent bout with meningitis for her slip up. Ugh. That's it's awful. That last it's it's oh boy, but it's only that last bit. Yeah. Yeah. So she was just, this is exactly like last episode, right? We had someone write in who was suspended for a year from their school for sexual misconduct. This is different, obviously. Sexual misconduct is different than plagiarism or borderline plagiarism or something like that. But she was suspended for a year. People don't do that by accident. Schools don't impose that on you on a whim. So if she really just had a recent bout with meningitis, you think the school would have been more sympathetic to her mistakes. Something's not right. Yeah. Um, the last, it's just the saying it's meningitis is the, is the kiss of death here. Mm -hmm. it, it happened when she was a freshman. She totally could have got away with it. Yeah. She could have just said, I fucked up. I'm sorry. And this would have been totally fine. 99th percentile LSAT top 20% at an Ivy league school. You're in, but this, uh, this academic misconduct. I mean, God, as a freshman too, you could so easily just say, I was an idiot. I'm so sorry. Mm. The room overwhelming, overwhelmingly sides with the applicant and gives her transgression a minor impact. Dean Kornblatt believes that the applicant is either minimizing or lying about the true nature of the transgression since it cost her a whole year of her life. He further stated that the apology statement was unsuccessful because it explains the circumstances of the event as if it occurred under acceptable pretenses and did not relay any life lessons learned. And then um, Jewish actor guy throws in, y'all should check out the Freakonomics podcast on apology analysis that came out earlier last month. Hmm. Yeah. So, right. The, the takeaway there is if you've got anything like this on your record, you do not get to explain it away at all. You just fucking apologize for it. Or you provide meaningful facts. You don't hide from them. Well, the, like this, the, the meningitis is, I guess that's a fact. Like there, she's trying well, to plead. Yeah. The, the problem is, even if she is going to bring up the meningitis, she needs to say, and it was fucking stupid, and I'm so sorry, and I learned from it. Like, even if it's a lie, <laughs> even if you didn't learn anything from it, you should say you did. Mm. I just, I, I feel like there's so much more here. That's what it is, right? It's the, it's the, huh? We're missing something. There's clearly something wrong here, and you're not telling us. You're still not telling us you're still failing to properly cite your sources it's not the lie it's the cover-up that continues that's yep. the problem yep she had such an easy excuse to just say i was a freshman i was an idiot i'm so sorry you know i've never been involved in anything like that for the following three years after returning to school <laughs> yeah i learned that it's important to you could even say something along the lines of it's important to appear, you know, be honest and also appear honest or I don't know, like I actually, I don't know how you'd say it. You just say you got to be honest <laughs> and then be done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Vignette B ready mm -hmm. the day after making a seat deposit an admitted student calls Georgetown admissions from an Oxford master's program to disclose that he is disenrolling from Oxford. Upon being pressed, he further discloses he is disenrolling rather than face an honor trial that has stemmed from an honest misunderstanding about his thesis and citations. The room overwhelmingly votes to rescind the offer. What do you think? 
I think also like vignette A, this female applicant, I would like to know more. If it truly is an honest misunderstanding and he's just trying to avoid the hassle of this case, then fine. But I'd like to know a little bit more before making a judgment. I guess we don't know more. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the point of the exercise, Ben. <laughs> Just go with it. <laughs> All right. The room overwhelmingly... Well, okay. <laughs> at this point, then I would say, like... I mean, if I were deciding what to do with this person, I would say... I... I don't... I don't know that I would... I'd probably move on. I'd probably not accept them. I know the dean goes in the other direction. I'm looking right here, but... yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of similar to the first situation. I, yeah, you know? I would have voted no on that one too. It's like, wait, mm-hmm. what? You got accused of some honor trial thing and now you're disenrolling from Oxford? You, When you applied, you were in this Oxford program. That might have been part of the reason why we admitted you in the first place. And now you're like, it's a fake out? Like, what's. And we had to press you for that information? Right. You didn't just why didn't say. You just come out with it. Yeah. Dean Kornblatt. Boy, that name. Dean, <laughs> Dean Kornblatt admonished us for condemning a man who was only alleged to commit an honor offense and who by Georgetown standards has done nothing wrong in obtaining an acceptance offer. However, he does go on to say that he did indeed rescind the offer of admission because the individual in question would not elaborate further on what the misunderstanding was. The Dean's perception. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't see that. The Dean's perception was that the man had done the math realizing elaboration bore more risk than reward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That one does seem pretty shady. Okay. Yeah. Vignette C, a top candidate with excellent scores and GPA, as well as a recommendation letter, strongly admiring his writing ability fails to impress on his personal statement. The statement is full of typos, spelling and grammar, as well as even mentions a rival top tier law school where it probably should have said Georgetown. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That's a good reason not to mention a law school in your personal statement. Yeah. It is supposed to be about you, not them, and there's no point in putting the name of a fucking school in your personal statement. Yeah. Anyway, the candidate is very competitive and the committee wants him. What do you think about that? I, I think we've said this so many times on the show. If you're making these kinds of mistakes and not proofing it enough to see that you put the wrong law school, you're you're not doing what attorneys do. You're doing what lower <laughs> ranked attorneys do. You're you're not Georgetown. I, I don't know. I'm not impressed by this. I'm not impressed either. Um, that seems. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't seem lawyerly. Um, the personal statement is the first document of your legal career <laughs> and having obvious mistakes in especially something as glaring as mentioning a different law school yeah, is just not, that's not what a lawyer looks like. If, if, I mean, now if this candidate had just better LSAT, better GPA, you know, if they were like 75th percentile in both of those or something. I might not have really much of a choice as a law school that wants to be competitive. You might have to accept them. But at the same time, how many other people like that do you have? Are they going to go somewhere else? I don't know. I mean, this person sounds like they might be going somewhere else anyway, right? Because they don't even care enough about Georgetown to realize that they put in the wrong school. They they have their eyes set somewhere else. Probably just better to say, hey, nice knowing you. See ya. I also might admit them and not give them a scholarship that I would have given them otherwise, right? Like just say, oh, yeah, sure, we can admit you, but... We're not going to fucking pay you yeah. not with that. Like, we don't want you that much. Like, okay, come to our school and pay full price and raise our numbers. Good. But like, I'm not going to entice you to come here if you're going to submit a garbage document. You know, what's so interesting about all this is think about what you're saying. And I don't think it's too far off the mark. Um, once you have the scores, LSAT and GPA, you then get thrown into the whole like, pot right yeah and last in the last episode we were talking a lot about the importance of your personal statement that is all of course in the context of doing well enough on the LSAT to get into consideration 
Um, so your LSAT score is the most important thing. It's the needle that you can move the most. So it's what you want to focus on most. But once you have that, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars hinging on the fact that this guy didn't take 20 more minutes to read his statement carefully or maybe an hour more to look up spelling and grammar rules. And now he's going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially. Because once you're in the mix, then it, it does matter. It's like, okay, these are people we would be willing to have our school. They bring our numbers up for a U.S. News and World Report. So who do we want? Well, I don't know how badly I want you. I mean, this this says the committee wants him. They want him for his numbers, but they're debating this because he's also not that great at really fundamental things when it comes to being an attorney. The room denies him. Dean Kornblatt says that his committee was fighting over this guy. He also said that Georgetown has 10,000 applicants annually and that there had to be a cutoff. And to him, a crappy personal statement was it. He also said that the top rival law school would love to have him. I wonder if that was like a little dig there. <laughs> kind of sounds that like law it, right? school is higher ranked than uh, Georgetown, they, they could always respond scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> what is the top rival law school for Georgetown? What do you think? What, where do you think Georgetown is most worried other, the students are going to go? I don't know. Well, it's, it's, it's the bulldog literally here in DC. I mean, it's the highest ranked school in the area. Right. Um, maybe, maybe UVA, um, UVA is higher ranked, but it's a little, and it's not in the area, but it's pretty close. So a lot of people looking here are looking at UVA. So maybe that's what Dean Kornblatt was doing, kind of shitting on yeah. UVA. Like, ah, it sounds like a UVA applicant. So, it sounds yeah. like UVA would love to have him, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, those people out in the boondocks. <laughs> All right. Vignette D. Bruce and Andy are applicants on relatively the same level of GPA, LSAT, and personal statement, except Andy has a little better GPA and LSAT score. Both personal statements were great, but Bruce submitted a really well-written Why Georgetown addendum matching his strengths with Georgetown's strengths. Andy does not submit an addendum. Does the addendum overcome the scores? If you had to pick one of these two candidates, who gets in? I My gut reaction right now is to pick Bruce because I know Bruce would accept. Or I don't know that Bruce would accept, but by taking the time and doing a good job with this why Georgetown addendum, um, I'm going to be protecting my yield, right? Yeah. I'm going to say yes to Bruce, and Bruce is, seems like Bruce is more likely to say yes to Georgetown than Andy. That doesn't mean that Andy should have written a wide Georgetown addendum. Um, it's You should always decide whether to write additional information based on whether you think it will look better than the rest of your application or worse. If it's going to look better, then do it. If you really don't have something to say, it's best to just leave it alone. Otherwise, it will pull your application down. Right? Like if Andy had written a wide Georgetown addendum, but it was clearly superficial or uninformed, that could end up hurting him. And it's better just to have if nothing there, I think. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do a good job. I was joking last night. I was joking last night that if you're a... I was trying to make a point about essays generally, that you should say only those things that are going to help you. And you should, you make the really important stuff stand out by not saying all of the unimportant stuff. Yes. People right. love to write about things that seem like they're adding, but if they're, if they're not adding much, they're actually hurting. Right. They're getting in the way. <clears throat> so I was, I made the joke about like if an astronaut on their resume has a line that says, you know, proficient in Microsoft Excel. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. my further joke was, I think the, the ideal resume for an astronaut would just be like your name. And then just, it says like motherfucking astronaut. Yeah. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> you don't even need to say anything more. It's just like, I'm an astronaut. Here's my phone number. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, because really like what, what possible line items are you going to put on there? That's going to make that look more impressive than just astronaut. Well, if you, if you really want to know, I would put the missions that 
Sure, of course. Not. My point is, you don't yeah. need to put that you were the you know TA of your um like you your graduate teaching assistant um t- you know teaching a group of fourteen um undergrads in calculus. It's like yeah, we are we already we could have inferred that. <laughs> from yeah, you the did fact stuff that you were before an you astronaut. became an astronaut. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. how you became an astronaut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but that said, I mean here, um. If you're serious about Georgetown, I, wh- how hard is it to write? <laughs> I don't this know why Georgetown had done up. It's just it yeah. can't. It's not hard. Come on, suggesting that maybe Andy's not super set on Georgetown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, have you seen the movie First Man? Mm, no, it's about Neil Armstrong. Is that the Ryan it's, Gosling one? Yeah, it's oh, super good. I love him. It, I want to see it. It's long. It's more like an old school movie in the sense that. It just kept going and going, but I actually thought it was fitting of the subject matter because the whole process took over a decade and I just gained much more of an appreciation of how hard it was and um, how hard it would be just to try to do something new, like going to the moon. Did you ever read The Right Stuff? No. That's an excellent book. Tom Wolfe, who's just such a fantastic uh, nonfiction writer, Mm. But he wrote that book about like Chuck Yeager and all the test pilot shit. And then it goes into the astronauts too. In that book, it's really interesting. Hmm. Okay. The room is evenly split between Bruce and Andy. We were allowed in this venue. mm, I don't know if that's the right word to have an open discussion among the entire 12 person group. Dean Kornblatt is surprised. He says, That after asking the same question across the country, Bruce always wins by a landslide. That's the one who wrote the Why Georgetown Addendum. Yeah. He goes on to say that giving lower performing applicants a plus for a Why Georgetown statement is a slippery slope because it inadvertently gives higher performing applicants who don't submit such a statement a negative. Of course it does. Yeah, that's I don't. That's a dumb point there. From that's a dumb argument. Dean yeah. Kornblatt is like, well, yeah, duh. Um, it does give them an advantage, which is why they wrote it. <laughs> no, but Ben, you don't get it. It's giving the higher performing students or higher performing applicants a negative. Wait, are you suggesting that the only thing that you consider is their LSAT and GPA? <laughs> He also said the last scenario is never that simple and over and only an overarching generalization of the addendum process. He only intimated that Andy would have gotten in over Bruce. I Wait mean, a sec. I feel like Dean Kornblatt is like <laughs> likes to like admonish his his you know denizens as they come into the room, but then ultimately like reverses on them. Was like you shouldn't have you shouldn't have excluded him, but we did too. <laughs> 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 or, yeah. I don't know. So he's mm. he's intimating that Andy the with the better GPA and LSAT score is going to be the one who gets in. I mean, the truth is, if it's materially different, like if it's more than one or maybe two points LSAT, probably that's what's going to happen. Probably so. Yeah. But if I don't know, it depends how how close is close. It would be nice and, to know the numbers here, Dean. <laughs> and if they're on the bubble. Or if they're, I mean, I, I guess they're not both clear admits, right? So they must be both on the bubble. I can't imagine on the bubble though, Ben, like, are you really going to admit somebody who's like below the 25th percentile LSAT? And you're just going to go a couple more points lower because they wrote and why Georgetown? Mm. Wait, what is it? Wait, where are you getting on the bubble? I don't, I don't know. What, I, what? I'm, if, if we're really choosing between Bruce and Andy, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that means that we're on the bubble, right? We're like, not, we're not. These aren't 75th percentile people. Sure. So they're, but they could be in the middle, right? We're smack in the middle of, mm, I don't know. I, I feel oh, like, oh, I see. Like, when, cause if you're choosing between, you're going to have one low score. Yeah. I, I, well, I just think that both of these people are probably like marginal on the numbers. They've got to be. Otherwise, why are you picking between? That's them? what I I'm saying. What saying. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. then, so then, <laughs> Okay, you're you're really gonna take somebody with an even lower LSAT and GPA? They already are marginal candidates. I don't I doubt it. I really doubt it. I think they need more information. It's like why didn't they give us more information? Why, why didn't, didn't they, they give us, give us the, the whole application? Why didn't why didn't they actually <laughs> let us sit on the committee and be part of the admission? That's what they should do. They could be part of the actual admissions process. Maybe this is like an Ender's game type of a situation, Ben, where um these 
groups. Oh, they're um, actually accepting them or denying them. Yes. They think it's just like a they, simulation. Yes, mm. they think it's a simulation, but they're actually doing it. <laughs> and Dean Kornblatt's like, damn, I didn't want to accept that card. <laughs> But I signed an agreement that I would do whatever the majority said. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. The group session ended with Dean Kornblatt telling us that we would hear back from Georgetown within a week, and if not within a week, certainly by Christmas. Not very sensitive to members of the tribe in the room. Wink emoji. His Wait, last. I don't, I don't get that because he's referring to Christmas. Yeah, because Jews hate Christmas. Oh, yeah. I forgot this is... A- it's still a date. Just a date. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not like I get infused with religious feelings as soon as I see that word. Anyways, I guess no, I neither, neither do I. I mean, as an atheist, it does not offend me if you refer to Christmas. I, I don't give a shit at all. Um, okay. His last comments were the most telling. He said everyone in this room, because he or she... Were? Were the first applicants to submit. You can actually say hey, they here. <laughs> yeah, but that's not even a sentence anyway. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He said everyone is. I missed the. I missed a word. My bad. Oh, he said yeah. everyone is in this room because they were the first applicants to submit. At the beginning of application season, he has a whole class to fill and plenty of seats. It's easier for him to give a seat to someone on the edge of a meeting requirements at the beginning of the application season than it is at the end. Hmm. So that's a big one there. You don't look at the application deadline. You look at the application open date. We should, we should caution people though, right? Like, if if you can get two points or more on your LSAT score, then as much as it would benefit you, assuming all of the things are equal, to apply at the beginning of the cycle, you should probably yeah. get that higher score. And then yeah, but it. when so, this podcast comes out um, in mid-December, mm-hmm. most people are going to be on the 2020 cycle, right? Hopefully. Which mm-hmm. means they have plenty of time if they start now. If you're <laughs> If you're thinking about law school in 2020 and you're hearing this in the end of 2018, you should get started now. You should take the LSAT in January, March, June, July, if necessary. And you should apply at the very beginning of the next application cycle. That's how you, that's how you want to do it. If you're going to do it right. Mm -hmm. You're right, Ben, that if, if they're, if you don't get to your highest LSAT score by September 1st, then yeah, you should probably keep taking the LSAT. But yeah, you there's no reason for that to be the case at this point in the cycle you should be able to get your shit ready for september 1st application yeah you're gonna make dean cornblatt very happy if you do you know every time you say his last name i think of splat points what is splat points oh well i wouldn't know because i don't go to orange theory but orange theory is like this thing that people get all excited about it's kind of like crossfit and they get splat points if they burn a certain amount of calories in a certain amount of time or something like that so every time you say it's corn blat i'm thinking splat points That's yeah blat it does have a mm-hmm. maybe um, he's the founder of orange theory <laughs> possible mm. um on my way out i repped the podcast hope all is well very respectfully Struggling Jewish actor. Cool. I don't. I didn't mean it when I said that Jews hate Christmas. That was just a. That was a joke because he was making a joke about how it was not sensitive you. to mention Christmas. Yep. Yeah. And I will try to understand that people might be offended by that. I we're, was just thinking of it as a date. So we're like a works date. in progress, Ben. Slowly. Slowly. We're trying. We're tr- <laughs> we we're trying to get better a little bit at a time. Yep. Um, that was very interesting. I'm glad. Thank you very much for sending that in. Struggling Super helpful. Jewish actor. Yeah. If I yeah, meet thank you. any agents, I will uh, try to send them your way. Mm. Should we do this Elsa India question? Do we yeah, have time? Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. All we right. Should it's it quick, but we it's your it. turn. Okay, go. All right. Ecologist. Ooh, smallpox. Um, this is from Elsa India 1. Or I don't know if we know the date now. Anyways, it doesn't matter. People can't find it probably. Section one, question number four. 
Ecologist. Smallpox, one of the worst diseases ever to afflict humans, has in some outbreaks killed as much as 50% of local populations. Wow. The last known surviving cultures of... I don't know that word. Let's go variola, huh? Variola, thank you. You're much better at pronouncing than I am. The last known surviving cultures of variola, the smallpox virus are confined to two high-security laboratories. Hmm. Some scientists are anxious to destroy the remaining variola cultures to which humans are susceptible. Research on the cultures, however, may someday lead to important benefits for humans, and so the cultures should not be destroyed. Hmm. Um, you know... This is clearly an argument that the ecologist is making. The very, very last claim, so the cultures should not be destroyed, is the conclusion. And although my job is to take the opposing view, I have to be very sympathetic to this point of view. I guess the only thing is that the counter is, of course, if these get out, then lots of people could die, and that's not good. Yeah, you have to anticipate the counter argument. So even if yep. you are a... No, we must preserve knowledge at all costs. Let's keep these variola in their high security laboratories and study them. The clear counter argument is, hey, what if terrorists break yep. into this place and steal the smallpox and like, you know, fill up New York City subway with it or something? Sure. That's the best counter you can come up with. It's like, it's not that they're just going to randomly get out. Someone may intentionally infiltrate the scientists that work there. And get it out on purpose. And that's, yeah. that's the biggest threat. I mean, my second, my, although I would also then go with what about a natural disaster? What about an earthquake? What about mm -hmm. a hurricane? What about a power failure where the, you know, I don't know. They're just <laughs> I could come up with a million horror scenarios here. Mm -hmm. Someone in the lab knocks something over and it, I've seen sci-fi movies. I read The Stand. I know what happens when they knock Petri dishes over. It sucks. Bad shit happens. <laughs> and there's a hole in their hazmat suit. No! <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Anyways, which one I find if you would do most to strengthen the argument? So this person is saying that they should not be destroyed. So if we want to strengthen it, we have to decrease the chances oh, that it will get out. Ben, we wasted so much time because we were coming up with all these weakeners. You're it turns right. out to be a strength in question. Shit. Uh, oh, damn it. We should have read the question first. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, well, we know how to strengthen it because we know what's wrong with it. Yep. That's, that's the key, of course. I hope you get that by now. Answer choice A. Smallpox has killed millions of humans over the centuries. Ooh, this is not sounding good. And when it reaches the stage of an epidemic, it is extremely difficult to eradicate. Okay, so we should destroy them, not keep them. Uh, a is clearly wrong because it weakens. Yep. B, it is more likely that the virus, if left available to researchers, will lead to an important medical breakthrough than that the virus will be accidentally released from the laboratory. <laughs> hey, this is... <laughs> This is nice. Um, although I will admit it's not like a great answer. The fact that it's more likely still doesn't mean that it's not unlikely. It's almost a necessary assumption. Yeah. I mean, if B is not true, it really does hurt the argument. So it, it's sort of like a defending type of a strengthener. Yeah. I will admit, though, I don't like it. The fact that it's more likely to lead to a breakthrough means that you could have a 10% chance that it will lead to a break. Or no, like maybe maybe it's a 50%. No, maybe it's like a 60% chance that it will lead to a breakthrough and um, a 55% chance that it will be accidentally released from the laboratory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not good. So no, it, I, I'm reading that as a weak strengthener if it's mm -hmm. a hard question that'll be the answer if mm -hmm. it's an easy question there will be a much better strengthener yep. coming yep yeah so choice c so we've crossed out a for sure b were either crossed out or on the fence c variola is a rare type of virus in that it can only be transmitted from one human to another yet does not affect rats monkeys or insects 
I'm glad that it doesn't affect other animals, but the fact remains it killed over half of local populations. <laughs> this does not – okay, the rats and the monkeys and the insects will be happy, but we will still be sad and dead. So yeah. I would get rid of this. D, it is becoming increasingly important to prevent any nation from acquiring the means to wage biological war- <laughs> warfare. I – I agree. Um, so maybe these should be destroyed. This weakens. This is out. Yep. E, it is likely that the virus, if released, will develop a resistance to vaccines previously used to control it. Oh, wow. great. So if it gets out there, it's going to be even worse. So all these suck, which means B, the weak strengthener, is the correct answer 100% because it does the most to strengthen, even though it doesn't strengthen it very much. Yeah, it turns out to be a fairly easy question just because the wrong answers are so bad. I mean, A, D, and E are all weakeners. C is Mm -hmm. basically irrelevant. Mm -hmm. B is a weak strengthener, but it's, you know, you'd you'd rather put that in your brief than any of these other four things. Yep, yep. And that's what you're doing. You're looking for the one that that would do the most to strengthen, even if it doesn't strengthen it very much. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Thank you. That was show number 170. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>